Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. What can I say about this game that hasn't already been said? It's an absolute classic that shows Nintendo and intelligent systems at their creative best. It broke the boundaries of what it means to be a Mario game, and although it wasn't a part of mine, it played a key role in the childhoods of many. I suppose the best way to start discussing this game is just to dive in. However, I would like to take a quick moment to say that this is part 2 of my Paper Mario critique, so if you haven't seen the first video yet, I would advise watching that one first so you can get some of the references I'm going to make here. That being said, let's dive into this classic to see what makes it quite so legendary. Hey there, I'm Carno, and I gotta say, I've been looking forward to making this video. After the success of Paper Mario 64, it was clear that a sequel would be a no-brainer, and even though it wasn't too obvious at the time, there was quite a bit to improve on. So after a few years' wait, the Thousand Year Door released on the GameCube in November of 2004, and saying fans received it positively would be a massive understatement. I'll elaborate on these things in a bit, but they basically took the original game and just made everything better. The story, the characters, the scenery, everything just oozes charm and creativity. But let's stop being around the bush, let's get right into the meat and potatoes of the video. The game begins with the story of an ancient city, which mysteriously disappears in the course of a single night, and is eventually forgotten over time as a new city is built over it. However, there is a legend that among the ruins of this town sleeps a legendary treasure. Now, just what is this so-so important treasure? I don't know. Remember, it's been almost a thousand years since this cataclysm happened, so all we have to go off are rumors. Well, anyway, one day Peach goes on vacation to this rebuilt town and decides to go exploring without the supervision of Toadsworth. Now, this may seem like a pretty bad idea, right? I mean, this is essentially the sketchiest place you can get, and she hasn't exactly had the greatest luck with being kidnapped. But if you think about it, Toadsworth might have been the worst person to choose as their guardian in the first place. What has he done to prevent her kidnapping in the past? Jack shit, that's what. Anyway, while she's on about, she comes across this mysterious merchant who offers her a locked chest, which will allegedly only open for a pure heart. Apparently though, the lock's broken because Peach manages to open it with no problem. We then cut to the Mario Bros, who receive a letter from Paracurry, sent by Peach. Inside, they find a map which was apparently in that old box, along with the nut asking them to come to Rogueport. And so Mario sets out, leaving his brother behind of course, and the adventure begins. Now here's where the game begins, and immediately the differences start to shine through. So you know how in the first game your hub is this dinky ass toad town with a few underground sewers and whatnot? Well in this game, you essentially are in the bums of Los Angeles. Windows are broken everywhere, crime is rampant, the entire place is being fought over by two gangs, and in the center of town is a giant gallo. Remember, this game is rated E for everyone, and even past that, this is a Nintendo game! I can guarantee you at least 95% that you would never see Nintendo make this stuff today. Like, could you imagine if they had you running around this place in Super Mario Odyssey? It would make headlines, the internet would lose its mind, politicians would start preparing new lawsuits, and if you think the creativity is only in the hub world, think again. The places and situations you get yourself in are just ridiculous. Okay, okay, so get this. You go to this little place called Twilight Town, and the entire place is cursed so that one by one, everyone gets turned into pigs. So you go over to this creepy abandoned church, and you see the asshole that's causing this mess. So you two fight, and he goes down within a few minutes. The entire chapter is over within half an hour, and you're thinking, really? That's all he's got? That was pathetic. And then, the scene cuts back, and you find out the enemy has actually swapped bodies with you. And it's not like he just made himself look like you, you are an empty silhouette. This guy has taken your entire identity. Now, you kids may not know this, but ID theft is a really serious crime. I actually had a friend, David, who was subject to ID theft. Now though, he's just Dav. <sighs> okay, here's another example. Remember how the first game had you travel to a tropical island? Well, in this game, they take that concept one step further and have you explore a pirate's cavern. Or for one more example, near the middle of the game, you take up a career in professional wrestling, where you're titled The Great Gonzalez, with the tagline, The Merciless Executioner. Now think about this again for a sec. This is a Mario game, and they're openly going with the tagline, The Merciless Executioner. 
But aside from that, you have someone sending you secret messages to uncover the dark secrets of the corporation you're working for, including the mysterious disappearance of some pretty famous fighters. And would you look at that, this person's writing in cursed font back in 2004, for no particular reason. I mean seriously, who does that? So by this point, I think I've proven my case that in the story department at least, TTYD is a massive upgrade from its predecessor. Sure some points are slower than others, such as Petal Meadows, but none of it feels outright boring. And really, the same situation applies to the partners too. Remember how in 64 they were more or less tools who you had to actively look for personality in? Well here, they had the genius idea of making them be the voice for Mario. This allows their personalities to just shine through even in small situations. Allow me to highlight some of my favorites. So in Chapter 3, you team up with this baby Yoshi, and since he just came out of the egg, you even get to name him. Now, I am fully aware of the comedic potential, but I just name him Chris. No particular reason, I just like the name. Well, this dude is basically one of the best characters in the entire game. He basically talks in pop lingo, which sounds like it would be a disaster, but it never sounds forced. Actually, he might sound a little bit like me, interpret that as you will. He's also got one of the objectively best moves in the game, so there's almost never a time you won't have him out. But he's not the only partner you'll grow attached to. Bobbery is a sea captain, but long ago, he was also a husband. He had a wife who was forever faithful to him, and even when he was at sea, their love never faded. However, one winter, she fell ill and died before Bobbery could sail back. Wracked with grief, he blamed himself for not being there at the moment his wife needed him the most. And so, he vowed never to go back to sea again. That is, until you meet this asshole who actually was there at her bedside and failed to deliver the last letter she ever wrote him. Once you give it to him, he takes a few moments to wipe away the last of his tears before joining you. This is something you'd expect out of a Zelda game, not Mario. You know, the guy who has as much personality as a piece of, well, you know. Anyway, so far we have ourselves a pretty nice package here. I mean, you have a better story, better characters, and obviously better graphics. But we haven't even touched the battle system yet. Now a few people mentioned how I didn't mention battling in Paper Mario 64, and that's because in my opinion, there wasn't much to talk about. You could either jump, hammer, or use a partner. Oh, and you also had your star moves. Overall, nothing really stood out. Here though, you are in a stage performance. So while you're trying to kill your enemy, you're also trying to get a bigger audience by making your moves as flashy as possible. But this crowd isn't easy to please. They'll throw rocks at you, run backstage and mess stuff up, or even boo if you miss an attack. However, on top of being cynical brats, they also will occasionally throw an item your way or give you star power. Now, star power works differently in this entry in the way that you have to play a minigame of sorts to execute the move. However, they're much better than in 64, although you'll only use about 5 of them once you get near the end game. Really, I could go on a lot longer about the battle system, like how you can learn stylish moves, or how you can get a magic spell which will give you random benefits, but in the interest of time, I have to move on to a few things in this game that I like to label. As great as this game is, there are a few points where the experience is spoiled a bit. Now, it's given that in games like these, there's going to be a bit of backtracking, but generally it isn't too bad since it's mostly relegated to optional stuff. What isn't so cool though, is when they take that concept and make an entire level out of it. Say hello to Twilight Town. But Cardano, you say? You were just praising this part earlier for raising awareness about ID theft, remember? And while yes, that part is fun, basically nothing else is. You will basically be going back and forth along this single path around 8 separate times. And that's assuming you know exactly where to go. And keep in mind, this path is about 5 minutes long. So that's over half an hour at least going back and forth because that's what the story demands. Okay, so maybe that's a pretty bad level, but that's only a single chapter of the entire game. Surely there's nothing else like this, right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to chapter 8. For the entire half of this chapter, you'll be chasing on Swipe bob who you haven't seen since chapter 1, almost 15 hours ago at this point, through basically every other place you've been to. Now remember that I knew what I was doing in the playthrough, but if you've never played this game before, I wouldn't be surprised if you chase this guy for around 45 minutes, especially since only one PC in each area gives you a hint on where he's gone. And you know what? Let's throw in one more example while we're in here complaining. 
At another point in the story, you have to backtrack to the previous chapter's location in order to bring back a love-struck couple of Piantas. And what do you have to do? Not only do you have to search the entire island for a lost ring, but you also have to sit through 100 lines of identical dialogue simply because of what I presume to be a joke that was just taken way too far. And what's worse, there are other segments in the game where Mario straight up falls asleep so you don't have to sit through so much stuff. Why they chose not to do this here is simply beyond me. Anyway, I don't want to give people the impression that this game is bad, but these things just have to be said in order for this to be a fair critique. And with all that out of the way, before I continue, I'd like to give a spoiler warning, because even though this game is over a decade old, it's still well worth playing if you can get your hands on a copy. So from here on out, consider yourself warned. So remember the story? Well, we've only broken the surface. For starters, Peach gets kidnapped, but this time, it's by this group of space Nazis. You think I'm kidding, but they are literally called the x knots Basically, they also want this treasure, except they know what it is. The soul of a thousand-year-old demon named the Shadow Queen. However, in order to resurrect her, they need a body she can inhabit, and Peach is a perfect candidate. So yes, in an E-rated Nintendo game, they take her down to a secret underground chamber, light some candles, and offer Peach as a living sacrifice to this demon, who then proceeds to possess her. Now, the ex not leader is an idiot and tries to control her, but she promptly decapitates him and covers the entire world in darkness. Now, we're just getting started. You and your party go to fight her, only to find out that she's completely invincible. So now, shit's hitting the fan here, and you're realizing that you're completely screwed. But then, the crystal stars which you've been collecting this entire game, along with all the people you've met on your journey, break the magic of the Shadow Queen. Now, normally, I'd be prepared to dish out some pretty harsh criticism for using the same Power of Love plot twist as in 64. But the way this is executed is so much better, and the emotions hit hard, man. Like, I'm a grown-ass dude actively fighting the urge to tear up as a remix version of the theme comes on, and you see all the people you've met over the past 20 hours cheering you on. I'm gonna have to give the writing a pass this time. So then, after a pretty difficult final boss, you defeat the demon, the world is saved, and you and Peach head back home after a melancholy farewell to all your partners. And let me tell you, as you see the sun rise behind Rogueport and the credits roll, all I can think about was just how great this game is. Except there's so much stuff I didn't talk about. You have the Pivot 100 Trials, which is an absolutely brutal gauntlet with no saves or health blocks. I died at level 95 and quit, but holy cow, I respect anyone who managed to legitimately complete it. You have the intermissions where you run favors for the Mafia. You have the entire side story Luigi tells about saving Princess Eclair from the Waffle Kingdom. You have freaking Flurry, and oh my gosh, this game's writing is just the best. There are so many quality jokes that go a lot further than just farts, like how almost all the females in this game swoon over Mario and his mustache, curses, side quests, secrets, everything in this game is just so good! In the end, TTYD is not only the definition of a stellar Paper Mario game, but also the example of a stellar JRPG, sequel, and Nintendo game. It certainly has its flaws, but in the end, I can certainly see why so many people say this was the pinnacle of the series. As one final comparison, just look at the differences between Goombario and Goombella. They are both starting partners, but when comparing the two, there's simply no contest. When I see this guy, all I think is Goomba with hat. I can't tell what his motivations are, or really anything about him. On the other side, you have this rosy-cheeked, adventurous explorer who's ready to see the world. She's even got the ponytail and headlight to round it all up. This may be controversial, but other than the sake of history, there's basically no reason to go back to Paper Mario 64 after playing Thousand Year Door. Everything that game did, this one did better and to a much greater scale. Both are Mario RPGs, but where 64 felt like a Mario RPG, this felt like a Mario RPG, if that makes sense. It's truly a game you have to experience for yourself in order to get the full picture. And with this success, fans were all too eager for the next game to come along and see what magic the big end would make this time. Well, unbeknownst at the time, things were about to get shaken up in ways that would leave the fanbase divided ever since. But that's a topic for part 3. 
In the next video, join me as we take a look at my first Paper Mario game, which just so happened to be the one to tear the fan base. Also, there's a computer who saw Peach take a shower and has devoted its existence to learning how to quote unquote love her. Rated E for everyone! Hey guys, thanks for watching this video and making it all the way to the end. I wanted to give this game the video it deserves, so thanks for your patience. If you like what you see, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you won't miss any of my future uploads. Also tell me in the comments what you think about TTYD, and more importantly, if you've been the Pit of 100 Trials. I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Anyway, I guess I'll end things off by saying thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.